Okay, tonight's speaker, Dr. Walter Kiefer. He is a staff scientist here at LPI in planetary geophysics. Uh, he did his bachelor's in physics and astronomy from uh, Texas Christian University. Uh, did a master's in <laughs> did a master's in science in planetary science from Caltech, and where he also did his PhD in planetary science and geophysics. Uh, Dr. Kiefer was also an in intern here at LPI uh, as an undergrad in 1980 something. Four. Four. Well, I was not going to say that. But. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Uh, his research focuses on the internal structure and evolution of the Moon, Mars, uh, Venus, with a major area of interest being the thermal evolution of the terrestrial planets. And his research primarily involves computer modeling of planetary interiors. So what's really cool then is they take those models and then they compare them to the data that spacecraft returned back, so NASA spacecraft, uh, in terms of the observations of gravity, topography, and surface imagery, and magnetic fields. Um, he also studies the thermal evolution of large impact basins on the moon, so the big dark spots, the mare we see on the moon, uh, as well as the differentiation, thermal evolution, and magmatic history of the asteroid Vesta. The second main emphasis of his research is using gravity and topography observations to study the structure of the crust and lithosphere of the terrestrial planets. He is a member of NASA's GRAIL uh, mission, spacecraft to the moon. Uh, which produced very high resolution maps of the moon's gravity field. Along with the GRAIL team, he's also been a member of the DAWN mission science team uh, when it was uh, doing its studies of Vesta, the asteroid Vesta. He's also actively involved in science education. So in addition to his presentation tonight, he's done presentations for us for our other public events, like our SkyFest event. Uh, he's given presentations for teacher workshops. Uh, he's also given presentations and helped uh, develop uh, curriculum materials for uh, not only teachers, but also for informal educators like librarians uh, as well. So he's very heavily involved in our education here at LPI as well. So, Dr. Kiever. Thanks. So, so I'm going to let the uh, clips kind of try and tell the story. Um, we have a tight limit from Paramount. Um, I, I don't have as much time to use for clips as we did when we did Gravity. Um, I've had to cut a little, some of them a little bit tight. There's at least one place where I really desperately wanted to show you something that I'll just have to describe to you. Um, but uh, we could talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly here, and there's more, not so much in the good, and more as you go down. I'm going to look at this as a chance to talk about what we do know about the insides of planets and, and how we know it, because science is not just a collection of facts. It's a way of thinking about the world around us. Uh, and so that's really why, where I want to go with this tonight. Um, we could spend um, a lot of time just picking apart the, the this is ba a big piece of this is built around um, astronauts and shuttle mission control and this audience, we could pick that apart for an hour by itself. We're, with one exception, we're not going to do that um, because uh, there's science here I'd like to talk about as well. Um, so I will uh, we'll show the clips, I'll tell you what I think about it, good and bad, and there is some good. Um, and, and most of the time, at least, I will try and give you a chance to ask questions, uh, and then we'll save some time at the end as well, I think. So, fire away. Okay, um, the, the good and the bad. Um, the good, the piece I liked here a lot, was the line, Serge and I are the clues. Um, because in, in many fields of science, certainly in geophysics where we're thinking about the interior of planets, or planetary science where we're dealing with objects that are a long way away, we would never have enough data. And so good creative scientists take their data where they can find it. He didn't have a lot of clues. Certainly he hadn't gotten one of the clues yet. Uh, but, but he was able to think outside the box. And now not every scientist can do that. But the really good ones can. And if you're from outside the field, it, it does, as, as, uh, as Serge said, you're spooky sometimes. That's the way it can look when you're from the outside. But when you're on the inside, it's just like, let's figure this out. Uh, so I really like that. That was actually one of the cool things about how they captured scientists. Um, the bad. Um, they all died to the second. Now, I have two reactions to that. Um, I'm not a medical doctor, um, but um, to, to get everybody dying um, within a second of something happening, 
Um, if really, if that's what happened when you had a pacemaker, nobody would survive their first heart attack. I think it's kind of a prolonged thing. You would all, it's, it takes longer than a second or else you'd never make it to the hospital to get, to get heart surgery. Um, and, and besides which, what are the odds that you can get 32 witnesses in 32 different places reporting the time of death to the nearest second anyway? Um, I, you'd be lucky if you got it to the nearest minute. Um, and uh, now maybe if three people drop dead in one room, all at the same time, you'd know that. Uh, but they didn't show us that. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, the, uh, this is the start of a series of scenes where they're starting to lay the, the groundwork for what's going on, the, the, the oddities that become the, oh my God, the Earth's core is not rotating anymore and the magnetic field is dying. Um, and so they've got a series of these kinds of scenes that they have to, that, uh, that Josh, the, uh, the one scientist, gets to unravel. Um, the next scene, which I don't have time to show you, um, they've got birds flying around and all of a sudden flying away into buildings, um, evidently because uh, the magnetic field has changed. Uh, at least that's what they tell us. Um, birds do navigate long distance with, na with magnetic fields. That's how they, how they migrate from uh, north to south. Um, but look, if you're, if you're a bird and you're trying to get from here to the other side of the room, you're not using the magnetic field because um, it doesn't differ from here to there. You, you, you use your eyeballs. <laughs> so, so this isn't working. And, and you know, the odd thing is they're going to tell us that something's happened with the rotation and something's happened to the magnetic field, and yet never do they talk about observations. There's a whole network of observatories around the Earth that measures the magnetic field all the time, and actually satellites too. Um, and, and, and these observations are used to learn about flow in the Earth's core, um, but also they're used to learn about the sun because the sun influences our mag magnetic field. Uh, none of that's talked about. We measure the rotation of the Earth. We know it precisely enough that you, you may notice sometimes they'll tell you at New Year's uh, Eve that, oh, wait, it's going to be a second delayed because they're having a leap second. Um, so they know the rotation of the Earth accurate to one part in 30 million or better. Um, and, and none of that comes in here. The actual real observations you could use, they're not making use of. They're only making them use these odd clues. So that's, okay, not so great. Um, time for a question or two, I think. No? Okay. Then we'll go on. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have to rely on our tech people about that. Ramiro? Ramiro? Yes. Can, can you fix the volume for them? Yep. Oh, well, okay, hold it. Space shuttle re-entry. Okay, is that Los Angeles? They're, they're, headed, they're headed for Edwards Air Force Base um, in, in the California desert, which is obviously a place where the shuttle landed frequently. Um, if you're coming in to land in Los Angeles, it's a very, very bad day. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the commander um, realizes that they, they, this is going on and they're about two minutes from landing and he says, can you clear a freeway for us? Sure. <laughs> so, so let's pick this one apart because, um, you know, there's just nothing in here that's right. And this is the scene and the next one we could pick apart for the whole, plus the mission control that comes later. We could pick this apart for the next hour. We're not going to do that. But, but I couldn't resist a little bit about the space shuttle. Um, how could they end up 129 miles off course before anybody noticed? And the answer is they couldn't. Um, um, could the magnetic field misguide them? Uh, no, they don't use a compass when they're landing. Um, what they actually, there are several things that they do. One thing is they have what's called inertial navigation. They have um, gyroscopes and accelerometers on the spacecraft. Uh, and when they're flying through the atmosphere, when they're doing their maximum heating and they're not in ground contact, that is doing the navigating. And it's actually flying the shuttle because with one exception, um, the shuttle astronauts were not allowed to fly it by stick all the way to the ground. One did, actually, this, the second shuttle mission. But, but normally the computers were handling that, and it was all based on the instruments uh, that, that measure um, the changes in the motion of the, uh, 
uh, spacecraft, how it's speeding up or slowing down, um, and its change in orientation, and it's projecting where things are going. Um, these instruments are very, very precise, and they're not subject to being misguided by a magnetic field. Um, they were originally developed um, to actually to get um, nuclear missiles on ICBMs to Russia. Um, they were adapted for use on the Apollo program, and they were sufficiently precise that um, back in the, in the mid-1960s, there was worry that when we sent astronauts to the moon, well, what happens if they're out of contact? Um, and we can't restore contact, and they've got to get home by themselves. So they actually wanted them to have a navigation system that was good enough to come home without ground interference. Now, mission control being what it was, they still insisted every few hours that they would send in updates um, for, for where the ground thought they were. Um, and they had a command for that. And, um, well, on Apollo 8, they actually figured out that the spacecraft was doing well enough that at one point before the mission was over, Jim Lovell, um, who was the navigator on that mission and later commander of Apollo 13, um, sent a command back down to the ground. Houston, take spacecraft data. Um, he knew that he was navigating absolutely as good as the ground was. That's how good the inertial navigation was. The shuttle's not going to get 129 miles off course. Um, uh, at one point, they say, well, something turned the beacons around. Well, OK, there is a navigation system, and, and every commercial airliner that you fly on uses this. There's a set of beacons around the country um, that are it's radio towers. And you use a direction finder, and you say, OK, it's at this direction, and you can get another one on a different frequency. It's in this direction, and you just do triangulation. And it's simple. You figure out where you are. They're using radar from the ground. There's at least three different ways that they're doing this. Um, the radar's not working uh, when they're out of contact, obviously, during the reentry. But none of this is susceptible to being messed up by the magnetic field. Um, and, and then the other thing that struck me funny was um, when it finally did put up that it recognized they were 129 miles off cross course, it put a bunch of decimals after that. So it figured out 129 miles to the nearest half an inch. <laughs> It missed the first 129 miles, but it got the last half an inch. <laughs> but it looks good, because how could you have all of those digits? Acknowledge. <laughs> so um, the next scene is related. So we're going to go directly to that. And I'll give you a chance to ask me after this. So let's actually go to the next clip. OK. I, I, I could not leave that one out. <laughs> These guys are having a really bad day. Um, there's some good in this, actually. Um, if you listen carefully, that sonic boom was a double boom, which is, in fact, what happens. There's a boom off the nose, and there's a boom off the tail. It's a very distinctive. I heard it twice during my time out in California, once at Edwards watching a landing. But once, I was in the middle of a math lecture at Caltech inside a building. Um, I knew the shuttle was coming in. And it was distinctive enough that the lecturer stopped and said, what was that? And those of us, there were several of us in there from planetary science. We all said, it's the space shuttle. It's OK. And then we went on. Um, it's a very distinctive sound. Now, um, there is a problem. Um, Sonic booms happen when you're flying faster than the speed of sound, which at ground level is 750 miles an hour. These guys were, what, 300 feet off the deck? <laughs> they were 10 seconds from landing. I guarantee you that was going to be the roughest landing in the history of the space program. <laughs> and, and what I don't have time to show you, because it takes about three, despite the fact that they're 20 seconds from hitting the ground here, the, the rest of it takes another three minutes. They, they end up saying, oh, you know what? There's no freeway, but there's this Los Angeles River, which is, in fact, a channel system that they use for flood control. If you've never seen this movie and you had any interest in the space shuttle program, it is worth the price of a rental just to watch those three minutes, because it is hysterical. <laughs> I don't have time to show you, but, but I'll just leave you with that. You've gotten a flavor of what's going on. Uh, we should take some questions. So there, we've got people, and I can't see, so you're just going to have to start talking. I'm, back with the, to, the people with the people with the mics, okay? Back to the first segment when you were speaking about the Earth's rotation and magnetic field, et cetera. Has the rotation of the Earth actually slowed at all? Have, has that been observed since we have modern science that can detect those things? 
the, the Earth's rotation is actually slowing down just a little bit each year, and the culprit is the moon. Just like the moon causes raises tides in our ocean and we raise tides on the moon, that interaction actually slows the Earth down a little bit. It actually slowed the moon's rotation down so much that we see it facing us the same way all the time. It hasn't done that quite to, to the Earth yet because the Earth is so much more massive. But the Earth is slowing down a little bit over time. Three and a half billion years ago, the, the day was longer, uh, uh, was shorter than it is now. So there are more days in a year, and I don't remember the precise number, but we know that because there are certain plants that have an annual cycle, and they make little layers, and we can tell the number of days in a year based on, on that. And we can look, actually look at fossils and go, well, gee, there were 400 days in that year. Well, how was that? Well, the days were shorter. The Earth turned faster. So we actually know how it's been changing over time, and we actually can now measure it very, very precisely with current instruments. Uh, but it's not due to something spooky happening in our core. It's something well understood about tides and the moon. As the magnetic field is decreasing, what's happening to behavioral compasses? And are, are, are in the, the poles drifting also, the north and south pole? Oh, that's a good question. Let's actually go through the next clip and we'll talk about what's going on inside the planet. Um, and I'll try and come back to that. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here that just has no physical basis whatsoever. Um, maybe one more. Do we want to take it from the other room? Yeah. Um, do we have any questions in the overflow room? Okay. One more in here. I'm just wondering, uh, in movies like that, aren't you consulted or planetary scientists? <laughs> you know, that reminds me of something I forgot to do. One of the things when I watched this the first time, I actually made a point of dragging myself all the way through the credits to look to see if they even listed science consultant. And the fact is they listed three, and I know one of them. Now, the people they consulted, the, the one I know is somebody who works at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Now, um, I, I look. When you, in, in most shows like this, the science consultant is there to tell them what's possible. That doesn't, they're consultants. They're not dictators. Um, the, the director's going to do what he wants to do, apparently. And they have a story they want to tell. And most of the time, they don't let science get in the way. So, but they did get some things right. And probably that is the influence of, of scientists uh, that were, were, they, were, they were talking to. But some of the other stuff, they just went whatever they wanted for their story. and. That's the way Hollywood works. Um, but no, I've never been consulted because I don't live out there. I live here, and I think that's actually a good thing. <laughs> OK, let's start. This is a long clip. It actually sets things up pretty well. OK, this, this scene actually has some good stuff in it. Um, OK, it has some not good stuff, too. but. Um, the good things, um, the structure of the Earth, um, the peach analogy in terms of the thickness of the, of the skin and the size of the fruit and the size of the, the pit, that's actually a pretty good model for what the Earth is like in terms of size. Um, when they talk about how the magnetic dynamo was created, when he said um, uh, electrically charged metal moving at hundreds of miles an hour, spinning at hundreds of miles an hour, creates a magnetic field. That's exactly what's happening. With physics 101, okay, maybe not 101, but 401 or something like that, you, you, you learn this as an undergraduate physics student. It's, it's, it's real. It's, it's real science. Um, and it's not even graduate level stuff. Now, you can take lots of classes in it way beyond what I've had, but, um, but it's, it's real. Now, um, Oh, and the electromagnetic field shielding us from the solar wind, that's also true. Um, then there's the um, not so good. Um, uh, the trillion, trillion tons, that sounds great. Um, that would make the core of the Earth three times the size of Jupiter. <laughs> Oops. Spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, well, look, the, the Earth is rotating. That's what they're talking about is everything's rotating. And, and if you're standing on the equator at the surface, you are, in fact, moving at about 1,000 miles an hour um, to the east uh, because the Earth is turning you that fast. Um, on the other hand, if you're down inside the Earth, halfway down, 
it's not as far around, and so you're not going as fast. But okay, that's a factor of two. That's not such a big deal. Um, the core stopped spinning. Ooh, that sounds good. And the question should have been not what does that mean, but how did that happen? How do you know? Why do you think this? Um, because you know, here's a good physical principle for you. Um, when, when you're thinking about this, there, then this really is physics 101. There's things called conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Um, you know, if you've got uh, your, your, your laptop um, and it weighs three pounds now, if you've got a little light one, and it wakes up in the morning and it suddenly weighs seven pounds, you're going to be unhappy and you're going to wonder what happened to it. Um, but there's other things like momentum. And the question is, when things are moving with a certain velocity, to change them requires a force being applied to it. Um, if your car is moving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, um, unless you step on the brakes, now, I mean, friction will slow you down gradually, but unless you stomp on the brakes, you're not going to come to a quick stop. The Earth's core is moving pretty darn fast, and it's a lot of material, not as big as Jupiter, but it's, it's a lot of material, and it would take a huge force to suddenly make it stop. And there's no obvious force being applied here. Um, they actually do eventually tell us one um, where they are um, imagining that they're going to divert all of the electricity in the United States and shoot it down a fault line and create an earthquake under China. And so suddenly, somehow, that stopped the Earth's core. And you know what? The energy involved just doesn't come anywhere close to being the right number. Um, um, but why let us stop that? And so then the question is, what happens? Um, planes fall out of the sky. Um, planes fly because their wings create lift. It's a fluid mechanics effect. It's got nothing to do with magnetism. Um, the bits about static discharge and uh, microwave storms, we'll talk about that later because there are some really cute clips and I did include those. Um, when they said the solar wind is a lethal mixture of radioactive particles and microwaves, um, no and no. Um, charged particles, yes, but electrically charged and radioactive are two very different things. Um, electrically charged means that, I mean, it's the kind of stuff that goes down the, the the wire. Um, it's, not, it's not radioactivity. Um, and uh, and the, the timeline, it's all going to collapse in a year. Well, uh, I was given a problem as a first year graduate student to actually calculate what happens if you take away the energy source for a magnetic field. And I didn't go look up the precise solution, but it was sort of a one page calculation. And the answer is it's about 1,000 or 10,000 years. Um, if you suddenly take all the energy away. I can't, I can't fathom how you would make it. You turn it off. I don't know of a way to, to actually make it stop in a year or how they could actually confidently predict that. Um, anyway, um, we should take time for a couple of questions here. Are we on time? I'm curious about the effect of the uh, magnetic field and life on Earth. Um, okay. I think it's true that we have life on Earth, even intelligent life in some places. Yes. <laughs> because of the magnetic field. <clears throat> um, how common are magnetic fields in the solar system and way out there? Um, about half the planets have a magnetic field. Mercury has one. Venus does not. Earth has one. Mars had one, but does not have one now. Jupiter has one. Saturn has one. Uranus has one. Neptune has one. Pluto, we don't know. Um, we'll know, actually, next summer when um, New Horizons arrives, although we actually may not get the data back for a while, um, but that's a different problem. Um, but we'll know about Pluto soon. Actually, at least one of Jupiter's moons even creates its own magnetic field. So it's a relatively common phenomenon. It has to do with this rotating um, uh, rotating interior. Um, it's, it's, it's not hard to do. A lot of planets do manage it, but not every one. What happens in the Earth's core when the magnetic field flips? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the Earth's magnetic field does flip its polarity from time to time. Um, kind of every million years or so, but it varies. There are times when it goes faster and, and slower. And you know we don't actually know the details of that. We've not lived through one. But look, 
there's been life on Earth for a very long time, and there's been a lot of magnetic field flips, and it didn't kill life. Um, so why it would kill us now, I don't quite know. Um, so um, I think we actually do need to keep moving. We've got 15 of these clips to get through, and I actually... Hmm? Sure. Um, let's defer that till we get to one of the other clips, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about some of the effects. Here are a couple of dramatic um, prognostications that this film makes. Let's, let's move on, okay? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I, 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 I'm not happy with Professor Zumski here. Um, science is better than best guess. Um, science is about figuring things out. Um, we don't always know things. That is absolutely true. But, um, you know, good scientists will acknowledge where they are uncertain. Um, I, and, and they will use whatever facts they can find to try and figure things out or at least place bounds on things. Now, I have actually said to students, we used to bring fifth graders from CCISD here um, uh, for a semester long program here. Um, and I used to tell them, and I tell other students when I talk to them as well, I said, you know, science is not just about facts. You have to know a certain number of facts, but science is about figuring things out. And it's true at a certain level that uh, in science, the best sometimes you can do is to say, I don't know, because if you insist on knowing everything, even when you don't, you block yourself off from figuring it out. And at some point, you have to figure that out. Now, okay, if you're a student in the room, um, the answer, I don't know, will not get you any points in any of your tests, even in high school. But that is the real correct answer to certain questions in science. Um, and But the thing is, at least what you do, if you're smart, is you try and bracket the behavior and say, in, in this case, you know, what's going on in the core, we know from seismic waves going through it. We know about how dense it is based on that. Uh, but you put bounds in your calculations and you say, especially if lives depend on it, as they might in this movie, um, you put bounds on it and say, well, what if it's more or what if it's less by a factor of whatever is the reasonable uncertainty? What happens then? I promise you the folks over there at JSC don't launch people until they've actually thought about that with their rockets. And really, a smart geophysicist will do the same thing with his models. He'll actually say, OK, let's vary this, let's vary that. I don't get to publish papers until I do those kinds of things. Nobody would let me do that. Um, and this science is just a best guess, not going there. Um, let's actually keep going, I think. We're not going to have time to do questions probably every time. Okay, that's awful dramatic. Um, and, and you know, I, I will admit, going back to the where, where the, you say, I don't know, um, I will admit that I am no expert in electricity and atmospheres or solar wind or things like that. Um, and so I thought, well, can I rule this out? And it occurred to me that, actually, this thinking out of the box bit, um, that, that let's look at other observations. There are planets that have atmospheres, but do not have a magnetic field. Remember in that list I gave you a couple of minutes ago? Venus does not have one. Mars does not have one. And yet no rover on Mars has ever reported a lightning superstorm like this. <laughs> and OK, granted, we had not had the rovers on Mars when, except for Pathfinder, the one that lasted just a couple of months in 1997 when this movie was made. But we had the Vikings that were there for six years. Um, we've never seen this, and they actually look for lightning in, in atmospheres of, of planets. They've seen it in Jupiter, for example. There's been reports of probably some lightning in, in uh, Venus's atmosphere, but like this, no. Um, a question or two. Uh, okay, let's try the overflow first this time. None? Okay, in here? Yes. Um, how much we know about the uh, fuel that is keeping the core uh, in molten form? And what is that? And where is it coming from? OK, there is actually no fuel keeping the core hot. Um, the, the planets, when they form, um, have a lot of energy, and you melt. And 
Everything that happens after that is planets cooling off, and so that heat gets out slowly. But you've got this big block of mantle and crust that is a nice big blanket that keeps the heat from getting out very rapidly. Um, and so the planet is just cooling off. Little planets, like the moon, um, oh, I did call the moon a planet, didn't I? <laughs> I call Pluto a planet too, by the way. Um, it, planetary objects, if you want to be nice. Um, the um, small objects cool off fast because they're small. Um, Hamburgers cook fast, roast beef takes a little longer, turkeys take a lot longer than that. Big things take a long time to cook, and they take a longer time to cool off. Planets work the same way. Little planets cool off fast. Big planets like the Earth take longer. So the Earth has just held its heat in for four and a half billion years. Now there is radioactivity in the mantle, but not in the core. Um, that actually helps keep it hot. Um, but uh, that's, that's what's going on. It's simply the planet is cooling down with time. Maybe one more? Follow up on that, how did it start spinning? How did the Earth start spinning? Thank you, Alan. The core, <laughs> the, the core I mean. I did not seed this question. The core. Um, when, when the planets are forming, you've got lots of things that are um, the clouds of dust and gas have at least a little bit of rotation as they start collapsing. Um, that seeds into a disk that has got a rotation in it. Um, it's The standard analogy is it's like a, speed, a figure skater. When things are well spread out, they're turning slow, and as they pull everything in, they speed up. This is angular momentum. And it's the, the spinning that's associated with that. Um, and now things are hitting the Earth, um, and they tend to be coming in in one orientation rather than the other, and so that tends to spin things up so you start off with a rotation. Um, it's not a perfect science, but most planets spin in one direction, and the ones that don't, um, we think we have explanations for. We think. We don't know. Um, but most things spin in one direction, and it's probably related to how they form. Um, let's try the next clip. Okay, some context here. Um, they figured out things are not working well on the core or in the core. They've decided they have to send a group of people, some of whom happen to be mission uh, space shuttle astronauts. In fact, the same crew that just about crashed their shuttle. Um, but they've been absolved because it wasn't their fault. It was the Earth's fault, apparently. Um, and so they're now going to send this vehicle to the center of the Earth. Um, they need a vehicle that is able to withstand the pressure of several thousand miles of rock on top of them. Um, they, they at least tongue-in-cheek recognize that they need something weird, so they call it unobtainium. <laughs> they, they got that right. Then, of course, they managed to create this whole vehicle in three months. Have never tested any part of it. Um, could we build a space shuttle in three months? I don't think so. Um, could we get a vehicle going into the Earth that fast? No, probably not. Um, and, and so they need to, how are they going to get through the rock? And so the notion is they've got these lasers out in front of us, and it's going to, to put enough energy into the rock to melt the rock. And so they drop them off in um, the Pacific Ocean in the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest part of the ocean. So that's when they said 29,000 feet. They've been dropping for seven, six or seven miles of, uh, um, of water, and now they're about to hit the crust. And, and the, the lasers better start doing something to the rock below it or else they're going to hit something solid. Um, now, okay, I could imagine that might work, but you know, to melt a column of rock from the surface of the earth down to the core, 2,000 miles, um, that's a bucket load of energy. Um, <laughs> they say, oh, well, we've got our nuclear reactor in the back of, uh, of this vehicle. Okay, um, I'm still thinking that's a lot more. I haven't done the calculation, but I actually, one of the things I do is I do calculations of making, making volcanoes on planets like Mars, and I'm just going to say, without having done the calculation, that there's more energy involved in that melting than the nuclear reactor can provide. I'm just pretty darn sure of it. Not 100% guarantee, but I'm pretty darn sure that that's the answer. 
The, the other thing here is, okay, the idea is the lasers are firing out in front of you and you're melting the rock. Now the, you have to ask the question, how far does laser light go through rock? It's solid rock after all. Um, it absorbs in about, you know, a micron, you know, one one thousandth of uh, a millimeter. So, you know, less than thickness of your hair. So you're literally melting things like right in front of your face. Um, <laughs> And you're supposedly falling at 60 miles an hour through this stuff, melting things like this the whole way. And um, <laughs> you do the math. I just, I'm, I'm not really buying it, but let's, let's just go on for the sake of the story. Um, but you know, the, the whole notion of, of how do things get through rock comes up about three different times in this movie. And that's, this is just the first of them. Um, but okay. Um, actually, let's do the next clip before we do before we stop for questions. Okay. Um, let's see. The crust is just rock. Yes, the crust is just rock. Now it gets interesting because they're going into the mantle. Well, the mantle is just rock too, as it turns out. It's a different kind of rock, but it is still rock. Um, Yes, it gets hotter as you go down, but it goes down, it changes gradually. Um, so, you know, if you didn't know that you were suddenly changing from the crust to the mantle, um, this Virgil, the name of their spacecraft, um, probably wouldn't, you probably wouldn't tell anything, it's, anything has changed. It's not like it suddenly got harder when they, when they entered the mantle. Okay, you get far enough down and you get to the core, life is a different story, but they're not there yet. Um, so, so I've got uh, a couple of questions left, and this comes back to the, both of them come back to the um, what happens, how do you get signal through this rock? Um, how are they talking to the surface anyway? Um, <laughs> you, you know, when I drive through a parking garage, my FM radio doesn't work all that well. Um, the idea of talking to the ground, uh, to the surface with even 30 miles of rock above me, let alone when we get 2,000 miles of rock above us. I mean, it just doesn't matter. Once you get to a point where you can't talk, you can't talk. Um, they have this problem actually in the Navy with submarines, and this is just in water. You know, you go down 300 feet below, the, below water and you're out of radio contact. Um, you know, they trail long antennas and, and they, they use very long radio waves um, that get through a little bit of water a little bit, but it's, it's a slow communication method. They have a code book. I've never been in the Navy, but I, I've got some idea of what they do. And because the, the, the speed at which you can communicate is very slow with these long wavelengths. They're not absorbed, um, not so much, but you can't put much information in them. And so you have a code book and you know, you might have 10 signals that says, okay, come to surface right now and listen for a signal, or come to surface in three hours, or whatever. There's a small set of codes. Launch weapons to Moscow, or whatever. But, but you know, plan A, plan B, plan C. There's just a small number of things you can communicate that way. You are not going to be in voice contact with mission control. Um, the other thing is, um, and this, the way we stopped is good, this blue. Okay, so the scenes where they're showing in the orange when they're outside, this is just some artist rendering. But this is, in theory, what they're looking at as they're guiding their ship. And I'm thinking, what the hell is it that they're looking at anyway? Um, how are they imaging it? Because you know there are things that go through the Earth, seismic waves. We actually use seismic waves, not just to learn about earthquakes, but to learn about the inside structure of the Earth. But you know they don't see things the size of you know, what's out in front of your window. They see things the size of thousands of kilometers. Um, and you know, that's, so that's kind of a problem. You know, how big are the structures? Well. This is something we actually have a decent handle on. The, the mantle is, does something that we call convection. It moves around. And because this is, and, and the re, one way we know that is we have plate tectonics. The Earth's plates move around. They create geology, earthquakes, and mountain belts and volcanoes. Um, and on all of that good thing that you learn about in geology is created because the inside of the Earth is moving around because it's trying to get its heat out. Um, but because things are moving around, the grains the, earth, the, the mantle is still a solid, it's not a liquid. Um, but the grains are very small and they're rearranging with time and they have to or else you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be flowing like this. So the grains are thought to be kind of on scale of a millimeter. Um, 
we're going to see things all sorts of different sizes, but you know, I promise you they're not seeing things millimeters across in this picture or any of the other pictures. I have no idea what they've imagined magic that they're seeing with. Um, but it's important because they have to see where they're going. And you know, we've got these great windows. We have to be able to look out of them. Uh, <laughs> We're not going to worry about whether this vehicle is going to be crushed. It's not just the shell that's made of unobtainium. Apparently, the glass is unobtainium, too. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that one, but, you know, how are they looking out? Anyway, um, a question or two, and where are we on time? Oh, crap. <laughs> Maybe not a question. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to show you two more clips because they're related, and then we'll pause a little bit. I actually... I, I have this problem sometimes. I talk a lot. Um, but let's, let's keep going. Okay, so now they've crashed into this big, what they call a geode. I, I want to show you how, what happens at the end. Show the next clip right away. Okay, so um, why is there this big empty hole inside the Earth? Um, I don't know. Um, and this is not a good I don't know. This is a makes no sense to me kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of pressure down there. The idea that there'd be this big empty thing, no, not so much. Um, uh, they, they say somewhere in there, well, it must be shielded by cobalt. Yeah, so what? <laughs> um, it's cobalt especially strong, not that I know. Um, you know, when you've got 700 miles of rock on top of you, you're going to get pretty well squashed, which actually goes for their unobtainium vehicle, I think, by the way. But, um, but, but certainly this empty space. And then they say, well, it's amethyst. Well, amethyst is a fancy word for quartz. And, you know, that actually does look a lot like quartz. I first heard this. Alan, you'll get a kick out of this. I, I looked at this, and, the, and I said to my wife and daughter, oh, look, they're going through this quartz. And they said, it's amethyst. And I went, no, it's quartz. I looked it up. Amethyst is quartz. I had forgotten that. <laughs> You know, I learned that once in 1983. My mineralogy professor would be going, Walter, you're going to have to get a lower grade. <laughs> um, time for one question. We're, we're going to have to motor. I, I, I want to get through some of the, the stories here, but we'll, we may have to do some questions at the end. I'll take one here. Very fundamental. Is the angular velocity of the core faster or slower than the surface? Oh, good question. So the question is, is the core turning faster or slower? We assume, actually, that they're all turning together. Um, I know of no reason to, to think otherwise. Um, people have tried to actually get a sense of that from seismology, and I actually don't know. And that's inner core versus outer core, and there may be a very slight difference there. But so far as we can tell, everything spins together. I mean, they're all physically connected. There's a liquid layer there in the outer core, and so you could imagine that maybe it doesn't quite, that you get some slippage, but we don't actually know that they are. Um, we, we assume, at least, that they are all spinning together. Um, let's go on. I really do want to get through the clips. Okay, there's actually some good in this scene, notwithstanding the laughter. Um, they are just above the, they're in the bottom of the mantle, just above the core. Um, this is a place on the earth where all sorts of odd things may very well happen. Um, it's very hot, um, and you've got metal on one side and rock on the other, and there's probably stuff diffusing back and forth, and all sorts of funky chemical reactions might very well be occurring. Now, the, uh, the core probably has some carbon in it. Um, we don't really know. There's a famous paper that was written by a Harvard geophysicist in 1950. It's still cited because of a table in the back of the paper that includes a translation of phrases in um, high-pressure papers about the interior of the Earth to what they mean in common language. And, and the one that's most commonly cited is the, Earth is, the Earth's core is made of pure iron translates into into scientific languages it's an uncertain mixture of all elements um, that's kind of part of the I don't know um, because we, we really don't know it's a mixture of things iron is mostly nickel sulfur but very well maybe some carbon and so things probably happen where you get funky reactions in this in this zone at the base of the mantle um, and and there's some seismic evidence that funny things go on there and I, I 
I, I can't describe it better than that. Um, so the idea that something's going on is, is not unreasonable. Um, looking out and going, oh my God, they're diamonds? How did he figure that out? And then I looked at it real closely and went, well, yeah, they kind of look like diamonds. You know, cut diamonds like you'd have on a wedding ring. And <laughs> I didn't know. Um, and then the size of Cape Cod. Remember what I told you, the size of little things? Um, if they are really the size of Cape Cod and you can see them in your window, it must be like 100 miles away. Um, and we're seeing like this, right? Um, so, you know, OK, there's some good and some bad. Um, let's, let's do the next one. Now, we're now about to go into the core for the first time. OK, um, good and bad. Um, the good, the very first part, um, when they entered the outer core, all of a sudden it got almost featureless. This is good because the outer core really is liquid. I wouldn't expect to be dodging diamonds or geodes or anything else. Um, so the fact that you're, OK, you've got these funky red and blue streamers. I don't know what they are. But um, you're going through something featureless. OK, that's fine. Um, the speed jump, well, OK, we don't know the density of the core perfectly. We actually know it from seismic velocities because seismic, we, we know how fast the seismic waves go through in different layers of the Earth. And the seismic velocity, which we can measure, is dependent in part on the density, it turns out. So we actually have some idea about that. Um, I think what they actually really want to be telling us here is that it's the viscosity is different. How thick or thin the fluid is. Is it runny like water or is it like uh, motor oil or syrup or something? Um, this vehicle must be less dense than its surroundings because it's mostly air and the stuff inside that they're going through is rock. And so this would be like trying to make a ping pong ball go down through water. If you don't pull it down, or in this case, push it down with their propeller, um, it's not going to go down. Um, this is a problem later in the movie where they lose power and they just float. No, they'd be bobbing up like a cork. Um, so probably they mean viscosity um, when they say, so then the question is, well, what, what does this do? Um, you change the velocity of the seismic waves, things will move. But the idea that, oh, well, the energy just will bleed away. No, energy doesn't do that. Um, you either, you dissipate it, OK, fine. But um, you know, it's the, the energy is going to propagate. It goes through the core because we we have no problem getting seismic waves through every part of the Earth um, and measuring them. So, you know, I just don't quite know where this is going. But remember what I said, you know, when you're doing your best guess, you're, if you're a smart scientist, you test alternate scenarios. Why did they do just one? I don't know. But that's not what any scientist would do if they were self-respecting or any self-respecting NASA engineer. Um, or any nuclear weapons designer. Um, all of these people know about this. Um, and so that's not the way scientists actually would behave. Um, OK, the next one is actually a, um, a side journey into what's going on on the surface of the Earth. And it's, OK, it's a stitch, too. Let's try it. <laughs> OK. Um, so what they told you at the beginning is they measured from satellite. It's an electromagnetic tear, whatever that is. Um, and the hypothesis is that suddenly the magnetic field is broken down in this one little place that must be about 100 feet across. OK, the magnetic field is very smoothly over long distances. The idea that it would tear in 100 feet across, uh, I don't know. Um, but somehow now it's letting in microwaves. Um, OK, a news flash. The sun puts out microwaves all the time. It's not very much compared to uh, visible light, um, but it comes through. And microwaves are not affected by magnetism at all. Um, they're like radio waves. Astronomers use radio waves to study all sorts of things about the universe around us. Um, radio waves do just fine. Um, television waves, I mean, you know, you do that at home. When you go home, you're probably going to watch the news. Um, the magnetic field's not affecting your ability to do that, and it's not affecting this guy either. Um, there's just not enough energy in that thing to, to sunburn the guy. Um, dramatic, but no, no science in it. Uh, we're, how, how are we on time? Okay, I've been told I've got five minutes. I've got two more clips. 
So I'm going to show you the clips and talk about them, and then we're going to do questions for however long they let us do questions. But I, I, there's, there is some fun in the next clip. Some good, actually, some good science. Sounds simple, right? Um, there is some good here. The idea of residence and building things up, that's actually very real and very good. Any of you that are parents or grandparents have probably used it because you're pushing your kid on the swing or your grandkid and you push them at the same time and they get moving and that's exactly the same phenomenon. Um, if you actually go back and look at the original clip where they explode one thing and it pushes the core one way and it pushes the core the other way, guess what? It would have done nothing. It wouldn't have spun it up at all. But the business about lining them up gives you a push in one direction and okay. The energy doesn't work out, but it didn't work out to slow it down either. But I mean, at least the idea of lining them up, that's good. Now, accurate to the inch, accurate to the millisecond, well, we have to think the energy is being propagated through seismic waves. Um, these seismic waves tend to be fairly long, um, and so it takes a long time to go by you. So no, you don't have to be accurate to the inch or to the millisecond. Um, it's like when you're pushing that swing, you know, if you're a little bit early or a little bit late, you get a little bit different push, but it still, it still builds up. And the same thing will be true inside the Earth. Now, but seismic waves really will behave. I mean, you get the seismic waves through here. It's a diversion, but I have to tell this story. Um, Seismic waves are used um, through the Earth to measure, to detect nuclear bomb explosions. Um, when I was a student at Caltech and they were thinking about a treaty with Russia to, um, to stop, test, uh, uh, stop testing nuclear weapons, and the Los Angeles Times got this idea to figure out how good we could do in terms of detecting things. So they called up the Nevada test site and said, in this period of time, how many bombs did you set off? And uh, they told them, they gave them a number. And they called up the Caltech Seismology Lab, and I worked one floor down from them. Um, and they asked the same question, and they gave them a different number. And I'm sure the reporter was expecting to find out that the Defense Department would say some number, and Caltech would have detected less. And then they would, they would have written a story and said, look, we can't detect the number of bombs that are going off. Well, Caltech did tell them a different number, but it was twice as big as the Defense Department admitted to. <laughs> At this point, the reporter says, hmm, there's a story here. As, as Ricky or Ricardo would say, somebody's got some splaining to do. Um, calls the Defense Department back up and says, what's going on? And the Defense Department uh, guy says, well, look, um, you know, there are a lot of earthquakes in Nevada, and Caltech just can't tell bombs from, from earthquakes. And um, so they called Caltech back up and said, OK, what's your opinion on this? And they said, you know, um, there's a lot of seismometers around there. And really, there's a big difference in the signal between earthquakes and nuclear bombs, and besides, Earthquakes are not known for going off on the hour. <laughs> At that point, the story ran. <laughs> so um, anyway, we now have a scenario that's going to, uh, they're about to detonate the bombs, and um, we're on to our last clip, so let's show it. Okay, so I have, I have two reactions to this. One is, I want that imaging system. <laughs> because, you know, Mission Control is not known for putting up video animations of what they think is happening. That's not how you control people safely. You put up what you actually see going on. So, so we must believe that this is actually imaging of what's going on inside the planet, and damn, I want one. <laughs> The other thing, though, is this stuff is moving pretty darn fast. And in fact, um, I, I did the calculation. It would take one of these waves to go about 20 minutes to go around the Earth. And it seems to be going a lot faster than that. But I guess you got to speed things up. So anyway, that is, in fact, the last clip. Everything worked out in the end. And we got at least part of our crew back out safely. Um, um, I will answer questions until they make me stop, and they're going to make me stop because there's food out there. So, so it's going to be up to, to Andy and the crew to tell me how long I answer questions. But I will, you wind me up and keep me going, and I'll just, I'll just keep talking. So, so, do you want to do? Uh, do is, or is there a question in the overflow? Okay, is there a question in here? Yes, um, uh, uh, the Walter, the, uh, the back to that angular momentum thing. 
because angular momentum has to be conserved. So if the core stopped rotating, why didn't the rest of the Earth speed up? Because there was some spooky force applied to it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's one of the mysteries of the movie. How did it happen? Um, it, you know, we, we just have to suspend our disbelief at that point because, you know, there's, there's no piece of physics there. And, you know, my attitude was I had to tell you about it um, and, to, uh, and to talk about, you know, this is the how we conserve energy and we conserve momentum are good pieces of physical principles to think about when you analyze these problems. These are things you learn, really do learn in physics. 101. Um, it's, it's made up out of whole cloth, and this is the sort of thing that, that these guys would have actually been trained to actually think about. Every one of them should have asked that question, because they are all that smart, Even, especially the guy who is spooky smart. They know that, so, but they didn't ask that question, and they, like, just like they didn't go look for the right data. One over here? But, yes, th this goes back to uh, the polar reversal question from earlier. Is there any evidence whatsoever or, or, or documentation to see how long th that the Earth would be exposed to radiation when in a flip, in a polar reversal flip? Would it be a matter of weeks, days, months? I, I don't think we know perfectly well the answer to that, but the thing is that the Earth's magnetic field is complicated. Um, they tell you when you talk about this in Physics 101 that it's like a dipole magnet and there's a north and a south it's actually a lot more complicated than that, and so when you're flipping the field and north is going to south and south is going to north, that doesn't mean that all of the other complicated structure has gone away. And so for a while the field may be weak, but I don't know that it necessarily goes to zero. The problem is you have to then ask for what kind of records would you have that record those details um, of the transition. And I think there are occasionally places where you have rocks that have fine enough details that you can learn a little bit about that. But frankly, this is a field of science that I don't know very much about. I hear about it. Um, there's a big meeting in San Francisco every year in December called the American Geophysical Union. And it's a great place to find out about the odd things people are doing. But you know, you get a 15 minute snippet and you might not hear about that field again unless you follow it for a few years. And so I can't always keep up with it. Um, the problem, I think, is that it's one of these things where we just don't have enough data to really say for sure um, exactly what happens. But I suspect it doesn't all just suddenly turn off and have an interval until it turns back on in the other direction. I just, that's my understanding of the physics. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, uh, so many of the plot mechanisms in this movie depend on the composition of the core. What is the uncertainty uh, as far as the mass fraction of the composition of the core? So the core is, I, I, I can't give you exact numbers. The core is mostly iron. Um, it has some nickel associated with it. It's hard to separate iron and nickel chemically. Um, and that percentage is probably relatively well known from meteorites. Um, we know there are other things in it that make it less dense than it would be otherwise um, because as I said we know how dense the iron should be at those pressures. Um, you can actually do experiments where you take large guns and you fire things at it and do what they call shockwave experiments and, and for short periods of time compress things and see what happens. Um, they have one of these at JSC in building 31, and they had one in the basement of, of the building I worked in at Caltech. Um, and, and when it went off, even if you were several floors up, you knew it, and you weren't in the room where it happened. It's just not for safety reasons. Um, so we have some idea of how dense that stuff gets um, if it's just a pure metal, um, and it has to have something else in it to make the seismic velocities proper. So that something else is likely sulfur, but it might be oxygen or carbon or hydrogen and probably a mixture of several of those things. And the exact amount depends on what, but something of order 10% is not metal. And in fact, the inner core is, as it solidifies the inner core, it becomes the pure metal and the other stuff, the sulfur or whatever, stays concentrated in the outer core and it becomes an antifreeze and it keeps the rest of it from solidifying quite as fast. That's the, the what we know and the part of the I don't know. Um, okay, one more. Is, 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 is there one yet in the overflow or is it? Okay.
Um, I don't know what causes the electric gradient. Um, and um, I think if you had that kind of dramatic effect, you would start seeing things like, if you can blow the Colosseum apart as thoroughly as that did, you start to question whether you could have cliffs that are um, five miles high existing on Mars, cliffs that are three and a half or four billion years old, um, plus which spacecraft electronics don't survive very well when they're hit by lightning. Um, you know, Apollo 12 flew through, through, through a cloud that was actually hit by lightning on the way to the moon. Um, and uh, they actually knew how to uh, reboot the computer because of the way the computer was built. Um, and uh, they gave them a command, and the flight controller's like, I don't know that command. And the astronauts are going, I barely know where the switch is, but they did it and it worked because somebody in the back room knew how to do it. Um, but uh, they shouldn't have flown through there. And, you know, the, you don't get to do that with a spacecraft on Mars. They've just, they've, they've never, no spacecraft on Mars has ever shown any evidence of being hit by even a little lightning bolt. I don't know what little lightning bolt means, but, you know, nothing like that. Um, we would see, I mean, we have, we have instruments on spacecraft, and I don't know if about Mars, but certainly at Venus and Jupiter, we have looked for the effects of lightning in the atmosphere. And while we see it sometimes, we don't see anything like this. That's, that's kind of my bottom line. It's, it's an area that I'm not expert on, but what I do know tells me nothing like that happens on those planets. Hmm? Okay, one over here, the last one, and then we'll be done. Are you a fan of the 60s movie, Crack in the Earth? <laughs> Somebody asked me about that at lunch a couple of days ago, and it's like, um, the answer is uh, I had never heard of it until... Um, just um, just literally a couple of days ago, um, somebody said maybe we should do it here, and I'm like, you know, I'm not even sure we could rent it anymore. Uh, I've I've never I've never seen it, so I don't know. And from what I've heard about it, uh, the concept is that a crack in the Earth eventually goes all the way around and it splits apart or something. Um, uh, the, the, so so the scene where you can actually start to imagine something like that, a scene that some of you at least will have seen, is. Um, um, in in the Star Trek movies from the early '80s, the um, not the Wrath of Khan was it the Wrath of Khan or or the one the Search for Spock? It's the Search for Spock, I think, where they're on this planet and it's regenerating itself, and you know things are pulling apart, and all of a sudden, gigantic pieces of rock go shooting up. Planets don't do that, okay? They just don't do that. Um, no evidence on the Earth, no evidence on Venus, no evidence on Mars, no evidence on the Moon, no evidence for any solid body we've got of cracks going all the way around planets. It just doesn't happen. I think on that note, we should go get some good food.